Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered what kind of framework you can use from lawyers to make better decisions and research an idea properly? That's what we'll talk about today. Lawyers were notorious for finding cases in the most unlikely places, especially ones with huge potential damager awards. Jody Picot, Handle with Care. Today we're going to continue our conversation about the book, How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why, A Common Sense Guide to Everyday Dilemmas by Kim Wheel, professor of law and legal expert at CBS. So last time we talked a little bit about how people make decisions about core ideas and how decisions are made in different parts of the brain, depending on how complex the issue is. Today, we're going to cover her framework for making good decisions and thinking out something in a reasonable way. She feels that this is a lawyer framework. And one of the things that I thought was interesting about this book is as she goes through this framework, she will, of course, give you examples in a court of law about how there was this trial and this is how it worked out and this is how lawyers decided things and researched things. But this is the part of the book that I thought was most interesting, that she actually then took that same framework, that same idea that was used in a trial and brings it up to common decisions that we have to make in our day-to-day lives, whether we're going to buy a house, have children, get a new job, How can we use that same framework in what we do? And so that's what I thought made this book particularly interesting. She just talked about law all the time in court cases. It'd be pretty boring. So she has a framework that is B-I-C-A-T by CAT. And it breaks down like this. There's going to break down the problem, identify your value and goals, collect a lot of information about it. That's a C argue both sides of the point, and then tolerate the fact that people will disagree with your choice, and you might even feel pretty bad about that. You're just going to have to learn that sometimes you don't always win every fight. But that's her five-step process, and we're going to talk a little bit about doing it. She says that when we're trying to come up with these decisions, she talked a little bit about the different parts of the brain and how they come together so that we can make decisions, whether they're simple decisions based on noodles or complex decisions based on moral decisions, and how our brain brings all of those together, all the hormones, the cortisol, the the adrenaline, the glucose in our system that gives us that ability to make decisions, whether we're stressed or not stressed, but our systems work together to give us the best possibility. Some of these decisions have to come really fast, like There's a rustle in the woods. Is that a bear and I have to run away from the bear? Or is it a raccoon trying to eat all the food in my campsite? That happened when I was camping. I assumed it was a raccoon. But why did I assume it was a raccoon? Because my heuristics tells me that in this particular part of the state, chances are it was more likely a raccoon than a bear. Other places in the world, that decision, that information or heuristics might be different. But all that comes together to help me make a quick decision, do I need to run into my car or do I just tell the raccoon to go away? A wrong decision could mean something very dangerous if we don't do it correctly. We have to decide in any given decision whether something is a threat to our being or if it's just a simple raccoon in the woods. She says that lawyers have to get their ideas right. They have to break the problem down into small pieces and then even smaller pieces. She says it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle sitting on a table and you're looking at all the pieces and you begin working through the problem one by one as you're trying to piece together the solution from the puzzle you just broke apart. It's much like that where you're really bringing it down into those core essence. Then she said that when you're trying to solve the problem of the puzzle that you just broke down, it comes into two different ways. She said one way can be a story way, what she calls, quote, once upon a time. Yet you're telling a story of something. If you were a lawyer that was talking about why one person assaulted another person, it could be a story that gets him out. Once upon a time, this guy found out that his best friend ripped him off. And that's why they got into a fight. 
It's a story involved in there. It's not really facts or figures. It's about what happened between these two people. And we get there when we break the story down, we look deep into the story, and we ask really good questions of what's going on. And she said that this can be everything from a house that we're going to buy. If we just look at the issue of buying a house, what kind of house do we want to get? How many rooms does it have? What problems are we trying to solve in our life with a house? You know, if you were in the pandemic and you were stuck in a very small apartment and you just wish you had some land that you could run free and let your dog out, those are part of the story when it comes to you buying a new house. If you're looking for a new job, that story becomes very complex because maybe you're going to get offered two jobs. You're going to get one offered one job that will eventually get you where you want to go, but it's going to take a decade to move up the ladder. Or this other company, which is going to offer you a better position right off the bat, but you may never move up anywhere. Life is complicated. And she says that we have to make decisions in a relaxed way. We take a deep breath. We take our time. We thank the person who interviewed us for the time. Let them know we'll get back to them. When I took my job at my last company, I had two or three jobs that were on the table. And I was debating between the three jobs. One was going to pay very well, but I don't think I was going to be very happy. And I think it would probably be a headache of a job. The other job that I think I would like very well had good potential. It was a software company. It was up and coming. That sounded pretty good. And then the last job was something that was really interesting to me. It was part of a hobby. I love weather. But the job would probably be frustrating. It probably was too far away from weather to make me that happy. And in the end, that company ended up selling to another company and moving out of the state entirely. But when you have these complex decisions, you have to sit back and do what I did and tell them, I need some time to think. I need some time to talk to the other potential companies I'm going to work with and get some answers too. No one was forcing me into a decision at that moment, even though one of the companies really wanted a decision right then and there. And the problem is, is that when we get into a nervous type of decision, our body has a physiological reaction, she says. It makes us clumsy. We may get nervous. We may get sweaty. And our systems of stress may go into action. It's why it's really important for us not to make decisions that are quick. Think about that bear decision, right? You're suddenly threatened with a noise in the woods. Should I run into the car or should I just stay there because it's a raccoon? And suddenly, because you have a potential existential threat to your life, you may get that hit of adrenaline. Your stomach might get irpy. You might not feel very well. Your emotions might be running high. Our same systems go into place when we're making an existential decision in our lives. When we look at buying a house or picking a job or quitting a job, suddenly those same pathways that make us ramp up. We talked about that in the last episode, 109, about when cortisol goes wild, it pumps that adrenaline and that sugar into our system. It's making us ready that we can run at any moment. But that same system when it's a more of an office or a decision-making process in suits and in handshakes can make us act impulsively and it can lead us down the wrong direction. It's why we need to keep that cortisol in check. Give ourselves a little bit of time so that we know that we can take some time, compare the pros and cons, look at the next steps, even look at the next five years to make the best decision. But when we're stressed out, our body doesn't know whether we're stressed out because it's a bear or we're stressed out because it's a job. So we need to give ourselves this chance to relax and to settle back down. She even says that you can give your brain a complex thing to think about and sleep on it, that our subconscious brain helps us by going into detail and clearing some of these things out. I don't know about you, but I've had those situations, particularly with the three jobs, where I slept on it a couple of days and woke up and I knew the answer. So 
your brain does process while you're sleeping. And so give it something to think about. Put a question to it and think about it right before falling asleep and see if your brain can't figure something out. So again, you want to break those ideas down. You want to give yourself some time to think. You want to prioritize the things that matter the most. And then you can even circle, she says, where one or two decisions come in line with the same decision. Coming up with that checklist of pros and cons and then even showing where some choices have the same answer will help us break it down. Sometimes she says it's harder to do because, again, that issue of the job, it may be that a job might pay better now, but the other job will pay better in the future. You know, there's all sorts of complicated ideas, but as we can break them down into small steps, small ideas, and work on them individually, we'll have a better chance. She said the next step is identifying our values. What's important to us? Our, our sense of right and wrong, our sense of what matters in the world. And sometimes our decisions don't involve that at all. Again, if I'm going to buy a car, potentially a car can make a decision about whether it has better gas mileage, it works with my budget better, it helps me take my kids to all the events they want to do, or it has other high ideals based on the environmentalism that that car presents to you. But sometimes the decisions don't have a moral decision. I was deciding which microphone to buy for the podcast. There's no moral decision there. They're all basically the same kinds of companies. But if there is a moral value to the question you're reaching, it's a good time to write that down and identify what's important to you. In the case of when I was looking for the job, there was one job that helped science and researchers do better at solving medical issues and coming up with ways to treat cancers and other very hard-to-cure diseases and I like that. That appealed to my moral sense of value that helping people get over horrible untreated diseases would make me feel good beyond just the pay. So my value played a big part of what job I eventually took. She says sometimes values are harder to see. It's easy to see the big issues. But she said that sometimes there's smaller issues too. She said that Americans have a sense of First come, first serve, you know, waiting in line. We don't cut in line. It's a very small moral issue, but it's important to a lot of people in America that there is an honor system when it comes to waiting in line. So sometimes those moral decisions are tinier than just the big issues, and you have to see where you fall in line with that. When I worked for a company in the past, I felt that they were taking advantage of the workforce. And so I thought it was unfair what this company was doing to other people. And so even though it didn't affect me, I thought it was ethically incorrect. We also think about the morality when it comes to our families and, and the people around us. If we have children, maybe you're going to make a ton of money in this new job, but you might not see your kids and you might be leaving your kids to be raised by your spouse. It's really unfair to your kids, to your spouse, and to you who won't get a chance to see your children. So bringing more people into that decision-making might also affect the morality or the values of your decision. Then she says that we had to collect a lot of knowledge on both sides of the issue. She said that we always have biases, which again is like heuristics, except it really cuts our decision-making process off at the knees. She mentioned something called my side balance, which means something good for me is good for everybody. But that may not be the case. It might not be good for your community. It might not be good for your family. So just making sure that when you research something and you look at the quality and the vastness of the knowledge and you're looking at it from both sides, even arguing against the side you normally would want to take, that will help you get past biases and make solid decisions. You want to figure out, too, if you do have biases. Again, I know that I think technology fixes everything. And so I have a bias for that. And I have to check myself when I'm buying a new gadget. Is this thing going to really help me or am I just buying another gadget? And I know when I'm looking at it, I'm biased towards, of course, this will help me. Look, it's a new gadget. New gadgets always help me. But that's probably less true than I think it is. 
So when you come up with arguing against yourself for something else, again, you're not arguing against yourself because you're just trying to play the devil's advocate. Let's say I'm thinking about getting a new iPad. Oh, a new iPad would help me in so many ways. I could bring it here and I could bring it there and I could research my podcast while I'm sitting on my couch. But wouldn't that extra six, seven, eight hundred dollars mean something to me? That's the other side. I'm not arguing against myself. Both sides are for me. Both sides represent a good in me. So it's important when you're arguing any type of thing that you do argue both sides because there's potential good in either direction. So every time you come up with an argument, she says come up with a counter argument. And if it's particularly persuasive, list more things. And do the rebuttal. You know, if you were going to be in a court of law and you were arguing with yourself about buying a new gadget or taking this job, argue the other side and see what other information you can pull up about the other side of this opinion. Then she says you want to set the list aside, the arguments aside for a couple days and see if your brain can't work on them when you're not thinking about it. Give yourself some time to think about it and give yourself some time to Contemplate what exactly is going on. And if in the end you're not really getting to a decision or it's still too cloudy, you have to do the other side a little bit better, learn more, and do more research. And hopefully, she said that in the end, it's going to be the best decision for you, but it may not be the best one other people think it is. Then she says you're going to make a checklist of both sides. You're going to have that list, you know, you're going to argue all the sides. You're going to take all that research, you're going to take all that value, and then you're going to put them side by side, and you're going to be able to then argue every side. You're going to decide each point, and you'll be able to list them so you'll be able to make the best decision. At one point, I was thinking about leaving the town I'm in and moving somewhere up north. I like the cold. I like the pine trees. There's a lot about up north that I like. That's where I went camping. And when I go up north, I have this sense of, ah, this is home. But that's not enough to just pick up my whole life and move somewhere else. There's a lot of decisions that go into it. So my friends and I were talking about how do you make a decision about how to move into another place. So I gave us a challenge to sit there and think, what would be the best thing that would happen if we stayed here? What would be the worst thing that would happen if we stayed here? And what's the most likely outcome if we stayed here? And then I did the same thing if we all moved up north. What would be the best outcome, the worst outcome, and the most likely outcome? And we started working out through that fact. We're still going through that process and we haven't come to a decision, but there were a lot of things based on the research that we did And then our checklisting, which is the step number four, that helped us see things a little bit more clearly. But now that we've done that, now that we've come to these decisions, we have a better idea about what to do. Then she says step five is tolerate the fact that people will disagree with our choices. And it may not make them a bad person. (laughs) My friends do not like snow. I love the snow. I love harsh winters. I love the cold. And when it gets to about 83 degrees Fahrenheit, I melt. So to me, moving up north is a no-brainer. But the people I care about, they're not sold on it. So I'm going to have to live with the fact, as they're going to have to live with the fact, that we disagree on some key issues. It's the same thing whether you're talking about picking a job. At some point, you're going to have to do it. And you're going to have to be ready for whether or not people agree with your decisions or disagree with your decisions and how you're going to work that out. And understand that sometimes you're going to lose, even though you think you made the right decision. So my challenge to you is pick one thing and go through this bycat method and try to break it down into small steps. Try to make sure you do research about your values. Then create the checklist so that you know where everything stands. Argue the other side or all the sides. And then realize that people are going to disagree in the end with the decisions. Just pick something easy that you can go through and see if this particular system makes you happier. I recommend this book. I think it had some interesting food for thought. 
I like, again, how she brought in real court cases and real-life human decision-making to make this book more interesting. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Please remember that a new podcast is launching in just a matter of a week or two called Small Steps with God. And if you want new ways of thinking or improving your walk with God, this podcast might be for you. I hope you listen, you tell a friend, and subscribe to this podcast or the other one, or maybe even both. Have a wonderful week.